And our final talk is introduction to the architecture centric virtual integration process by Rand Willock. Rand is a senior principal research scientist at Avendium Labs with experience in program management, system engineering and software development, including diverse technical expertise with fault management, error analysis, cybersecurity, sensor processing, biometrics, human interfaces, and robotics. And joining Rand for his question and answer session following was his colleague, Adam Gordon. Rand, welcome, take it away. Thank you, Shane. And thank you for allowing me to give an overview of uh, ACVIP and some of the training materials that we've developed. First, I want to acknowledge the uh, DEVCOM Aviation and Missile Center, and uh, especially Alex Boydston for supporting the development of this training and really for spearheading the ACVIP technology development. So what we're gonna do today is really give you an overview of the first module of an ACVIP modeling and analysis training class that we're developing. Now we wanna make this an interactive session uh, kind of to combat what my kids tell me is uh, Zoom fatigue. So we're gonna try to have a little bit of fun and make it interactive. Now that's a little bit more difficult uh, given the, the uh, YouTube channel. But what we want you to do is uh, give us comments using the chat function. And also we're going to solicit some, uh, some inputs for some of our exercises and we'll have you use chat for that as well. So first a little bit about our training class. Our training class is an interactive hands-on training course to give participants an understanding of the ACVIP uh, modeling techniques and analysis tools. Now, if you want more specific information on the class, you can go to the Adventium Labs homepage at adventiumlabs.com. And in the upper right corner is an ACVIP training button. And that will tell you all to know about registering for the class. A little bit more detail on the class. It's an interactive hands-on using uh, OSATE and of course AADL. It's gonna be a live class. We'll probably do it via Teams. And it's based on the ACVIP Modeling and Analysis Handbook. Um, I'm told that the Modeling and Analysis Handbook has now been approved for, uh, for public release. The target audience for our class are system designers and developers. But we also think that the first two sessions will be useful for project managers. Uh, you're getting an overview of kind of the first session today. The second session gets in to the ACVIP management plan. Um, if you take the class, experience in AADL is useful, but not totally required. Uh, we do want to work with some models. We'll do be adding some parameters and doing some analysis on models. So certainly AADL experience will be useful. The class will be about eight sessions. Uh, there'll be uh, mornings over a couple a week in March, and then we'll have another one in April. So what I want to do today is just kind of give you an overview of what the objectives are for module one of the class. We'll talk about what is ACVIP, and then we're going to talk about sort of what the goals for program management are. And that's where we're going to ask for some inputs from you. Then we're going to go over some project issues. Where's, what are some things that can go wrong with uh, complex development projects? And we've got an example, kind of a fun little news story of a project gone awry. We're gonna ask you to uh, provide some input on those issues and we'll use that in some of the later exercises. At that point, we're going to um, also present ACVIP solutions. And then the exercise will be, we'll kind of match up some of the issues provided and show you how ACVIP solutions meet those issues. And then we'll end up going through an ACVIP workflow walkthrough and give you kind of a peek into what the remaining of the class will look like. So project management goals. This is the point where we wanna solicit some goals. Uh, why do we do project management in the first place? What are things that we want to get out of our project management? Uh, what are things that you would put into your project management plan? So please provide your inputs on this uh, via chat and we'll use those in a couple of minutes. So the learning objectives for our ACVIP class are really to give you an understanding of how ACVIP can address many of those issues found during complex system development programs, especially 
when we're talking about embedded systems, hardware and software combinations. Now let's back up a minute and say, now what is ACFIP? Well, the Architecture Centric Virtual Integration Process or ACFIP consists of processes, methods, tools to perform model-based virtual integration on embedded computing systems. This is best shown with an example. So let's look at the traditional development process. First, we have a requirements task followed by an engineering task. And there may be uh, engineering for hardware components and software components. And even this early on, you know, bugs can be discovered, which might require going back and redoing some of the engineering or some of the requirements. Moving on to implementation, we might discover more issues. Certainly in unit testing, we discover lots of issues. But the big problem occurs during integration when we start finding big issues there. The problem with finding issues that late is that often they require rework, going back, changing the implementation, changing the engineering, sometimes even going back and changing the requirements. This can be very expensive because at this point, we've bent metal, we've got uh, hardware running, we've got uh, software coded and to make changes is very expensive. Now let's contrast that with the ACFIP process. ACFIP, we start out with the requirements process, but then as part of the engineering, we use virtual integration. We do use models of the systems and very early on, we can start looking at integrating the models to find out if there are gonna be issues such as mismatched inputs and outputs or overloading certain resources. The nice thing about doing this check very early on is that to go back and make changes really just is a very inexpensive step of going back, changing your model, or even if you have to go back and look at requirements, but we can find these issues much earlier. And then the idea is that we will find less bugs in the implementation, in the testing, and certainly when we get to integration, that will go much smoother. So now we're to the point where we want to uh, talk about some of these program management goals. And hopefully, Adam, you have uh, pulled a couple out of chat. So we're going to play this kind of like the, uh, the game show Family Feud, where here I have a list of the top seven program management goals as uh, determined by the uh, AADL user days. And so, uh, Adam, what do, uh, what do we have here? I've got a few here in the uh, chat. Okay. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to give them to you in the order they've arrived. Well, give, give them to me one at a time. Because yeah. I, I know too much. So the first okay. one is uh, scope control. Scope control. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm going to put that kind of in the category of, of, of technical risk as we, get, as we get scope creep and things. It really does incre increase project technical risk. And technical risk management is really important, especially when we're talking about new technologies or challenging performance requirements. Um, what we can do in our, in our ACVIB modeling is we can use our models to reduce ambiguity and therefore documentation errors. Our model can uh, form a lot of the documentation, kind of a single source of truth or an authoritative source of truth. We can use our model to improve consistency and interoperability between multiple developers. We can retain institutional knowledge through our models. Our models can continue we write general models and can put them in libraries and things. They can form some of the institutional knowledge about certain systems. And another way to reduce, reduce the risk is we can support analysis at all different stages of development. So the big message here is that uh, uncertainties really can contribute to, to technical risk. And uh, to highlight this, uh, this is actually a slide that John showed just earlier, but it really does drive home the point that we've got these very complex systems and we've got hidden dependencies. But meanwhile, we're trying to balance multiple kinds of requirements. So um, we might be looking at security, issues, security requirements, resource utilization requirements, real time data quality. And we need to look at how small changes in the system can really have very broad effects. So for example, if we change our encryption from 128 bits to 256 bits, 
that's going to re result in higher CPU demand, which could cause an increased latency in some of our signals, which might actually affect the temporal correctness of some of our data, which in turn could lead to a potential new hazard. So all of these things are ramifications of this small change. Small changes have very wide system-wide ramifications. Let me back up and uh, see if we've got some others on the list there, Adam. Sure, we've got, I'm, I'm gonna give you two now. I think they're related. Ah, one, yeah. one is, it says, don't ruin the budget. Oh my I think is good. Budget. And then okay. the other person says, how does the PM avoid schedule overruns, which ultimately lead to cost overruns? Absolutely, and, and, and I put that kind of as the number one, what we want out of our program management is really reducing the risk of project and cost and schedule overruns. We're always talking about keeping the costs down but meeting our schedule. And be, doing the risk management for cost and schedule really begins with risk identification. What we want to do is detect early on these defects in these embedded systems. And virtual integration, ACVIP, can really help with that. We can address these issues early when it's less impact on cost and schedule. And another thing that can really help budget is this uh, model-based development and, and following the ACVIP process can support parallel development. As I'll talk about a, a, a little bit later, we can have models of different fidelity and different portions of the model, and you can develop components in parallel and still do very rapid testing by virtual integration. So meeting cost and schedule are key goals for program management. Now, if we go back to our chart of the development process, we look at the traditional process, uh, small amount of, of dollars in the engineering and implementation. When we get to system integration, addressed in these bugs can be very, very expensive. If we look at ACVIP, we can kind of smooth this out and reduce the overall costs. There might be a little bit of upfront costs to do a little bit more modeling and things, but the payoff is up in the system integration. I borrow this slide from uh, Alex presented yesterday, but it, it really drives home this point. If we look at this top line, this kind of shows where in the development process, when are defects introduced? And over half of the, over half of the defects are introduced in requirements and design. Very few are introduced way at the end in integration. But if we look at the second row, we find when are we finding these defects? And you look, we're finding them way back in testing and integration. And then the bottom line, talking about costs, when is it most expensive to address these issues? Addressing issues and requirements, very inexpensive compared with majority of the costs are way up in integration and addressing issues there. So bottom line, finding and addressing defects early saves costs. All so right, this one's uh, interesting, Rand. I'm curious where you might uh, slot it. Okay. Uh, this, this is from uh, Mark Brown. Estimates to complete for deliverables with deadlines and revising the definition of done during Agile. Where do you want to slot that? Revising I, I... the definition of done. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to, this is a little bit of a stretch, but it kind of falls into this capability category in, in adding more um, capability. And, and knowing, especially adding capability within within a fixed a fixed budget and time frame. Um, but one of the big goals for for our projects is we want to field better capabilities more rapidly, and and this requires us we want to we want to improve system quality, and one of the ways we can really help with the, the quality is by doing trade studies. Uh, we can do cost versus capability, and we can do these trade studies fairly inexpensively early on using models. You can do lots of what if kinds of things. You can do trade studies that allow you to try before you buy or more appropriately try before you build. And um, you, you, can, you can see, should I have this component or this other component, trade them off, run your analysis and, and do side by side comparisons. And then the problem is that when issues arrive, capabilities are often sacrificed in order to stay on budget and schedule. So that kind of relates capability to, to keeping things on schedule. 
the other thing that, uh, and, and this was mentioned uh, by a couple of talks yesterday, is that when we talk about in, increased capability, more and more what that really means is additional lines of software code. Uh, this is just showing that the, the complexity of the systems in terms of lines of, of code is, is just incre increasing exponentially. And if we can reduce the risk of these lines of software code, we can add this capability and keep things in schedule. This is a nice one from Mr. Lewis. Incremental okay. refinement of requirements and design. Ooh, incremental yeah. refinement. You know, that is one that we are going to address um, in just a minute, in a uh, little bit later in the presentation. We'll talk a little bit more right. about it. incremental refinement. Yes. All right. I noticed uh, no one talked about verification or certification. I, oh, my gosh. But yeah. that is definitely one that often comes up. So let's, let's talk about uh, verification and certification. So we can reduce the costs and increase the positive outcomes of these certification and verification processes using an ACFIP process. And a couple, it really helps us in a couple of ways. One is we can define this process in terms of uh, the analysis verification that we need to do along the way. And then what's really nice about um, virtual integration is that we can conduct this verification throughout the development process. And this really reduces surprises late in the project. So as we go and develop our system, we can continuously be looking at the kinds of analysis that we need to support these verification and certification processes. What about uh, building in the flexibility uh, in the project to integrate future technical upgrades? Uh, future technical upgrades, that's something that was mentioned a couple of times yesterday, all about life cycle and upgrades. And uh, ACVIP is, is a good way to uh, consider life cycle costs and things um, across the full program. We really want to consider costs for operation and sustainability very early in the program and then anticipate and even assist in future upgrades. And the way we can do that is by um, reusing these models. Um, once we have the system modeled, you want to do an upgrade. It's uh, easy to do, once again, the trade studies and things to look at how that affects this, uh, things within the model. We can um, use those assets, those model assets, those documentation assets to reduce cost, schedule, and risk for future upgrades and future programs. And the cost of these assets, the cost of using the or creating these assets uh, can be spread across product lines or spread across families of systems. So I've got a nice chart that kind of shows, shows how this works. If you look at the line on this chart, that is when costs are determined. And what this shows is that early in the requirements phase, many, many of the life cycle costs are already decided. But these costs and the bars on this chart show when those costs are incurred. So what this really means is that when we're doing our early design and requirements, we are determining how much these later life cycle costs are going to be. So it's very important that we consider these costs when we're in these stages. All right, we've run out of guesses. I know there's well, one box left, I've, but I don't I've want to be buzzed more. out. Yeah. No, I'm going to um, I'm going to think back to our keynote address yesterday, and uh, Mr. Mason talked all about MOSA. So let's uh, show that ACVIP is a very good way to address MOSA. When MOSA is talking about modular design, um, having our our models. Uh, developed modularly and hierarchically uh, fits that need uh, very well. We have major system components that are severable and we can support easy component replacement. You can do the trade studies and things. Uh, the ACVIP process really uh, enforces that, uh, enforces key interfaces between these components. The AADL is, uh, is fabulous uh, formal language for defining, defining interfaces, the data types passing between them and the 
the properties of those data types like latencies and things. And it, inter and, um, it, it complies with industry standards. AADL itself is an industry standard, but we can use some of our analysis tools and things to look at compliance with industry standards. Well, I think we've covered um, enough for program management goals. I think we wanna move forward. I will tell you, we had one more that was kind of just a catch all for everything else. And what we'll do is we'll collect the, the goals that you mentioned in your comments and things. And we'll be using that to kind of uh, upgrade the class and make sure that it is relevant to our audience. Now we're gonna solicit some other inputs from you. Um, what are some common issues that can be found when you're developing these complex projects? Now, these can either be from your own experience or we're going to show a news story of a uh, project that didn't go so well. And these can be either, you know, higher level project management issues or even potentially some technical uh, requirements kinds of issues. And then we'll see if we can match some of those up with our, our ACVEP uh, solutions. So at this point, I'm going to attempt to play a video. Here we go. We turn now to another unfortunate setback for the helicopter program out of Fredonia. Government officials are confounded by this latest failure of what should have been Europe's newest high-tech rotocraft in over 40 years. Operational deployment of the high-tech aircraft dubbed the Waterloo keeps getting pushed back after more than a decade of intense development and a budget that now exceeds one and a half trillion euros. The Waterloo was unveiled Thursday evening at a highly anticipated public event. Celebrated test pilot Napster Bonaparte settled into the cockpit and quickly lifted off, but problems immediately arose when he couldn't see the gauges on his instrument panel. Every time he changed course relative to the late day sun, it caused shadows on the displays making them essentially unreadable. The highly acclaimed Autobright display took critical extra seconds to adapt to the light levels, unable to catch up as the aircraft changed its course. The cockpit lighting was never able to correctly adjust, making the picture as flight into the evening sun nearly impossible. Thinking quickly, Bonaparte activated the built-in music software to play Flight of the Valkyries, but this apparently drained precious bandwidth and made the flight controls sluggish and unresponsive. Matters weren't helped when the complex flight plan designed to show off the versatility of the aircraft overloaded the main memory, forcing the pilot to make an emergency landing. After sundown, Bonaparte gamely made a second attempt to fly the aircraft. However, it was a hot summer night and he reported issues trying to power all of the lighting systems at the same time his cooling system was set to max. Things seemed to be getting on track when a state-of-the-art obstacle avoidance system started veering the aircraft to the left to evade a radio tower that was over 10 kilometers away. This was later traced to an imperial versus metric unit discrepancy between the radar supplier and the obstacle avoidance software. When the main CPU suffered a thermal shutdown due to being overloaded, it was the last straw. The aircraft was grounded once and for all, and the event hastily concluded. The normally unflappable Bonaparte lamented, if only we had done these tests earlier in the program, we could have changed the design. In the aftermath of this embarrassing public display, project engineer Louis Blerio just shook his head at the daunting technical challenge of integrating sophisticated software systems developed by so many different contractors. When integrators went back and rechecked components, all the individual parts worked as specified, but they clearly didn't work together. All project staff and contractors have convened at the island of St. Helena to conduct an emergency team review of the issues. Reports of their initial progress indicate they are at a stalemate with lots of yelling. One engineer who spoke on the condition of anonymity revealed the problem wasn't failed requirements for a single component. The problem was that we had not properly analyzed the total resource utilization for the assembled system back when we could have easily done something about it. Next, 
Will there be a happy ending for this kitten stuck in a tree? Update after we check on the lottery numbers. All characters, projects, and other entities appearing in this work are fictitious, and a resemblance to real persons dead or alive, or other projects or real-life entities, past or present, is purely coincidental. So that ought to seed some ideas on uh, some of the kinds of issues that can befall these complex projects. Now what I'd like to do is uh, tell you about some of the solutions in ACTVIP that uh, I think we can use to, uh, to address some of these kinds of issues, or, or more importantly, prevent them. One of the key points about ACTVIP is it's model-based. We use a model representation of the system and even the outside physical world. Models conform to industry standards, which really promotes interoperability. You can plug and play different components in the model. And in ACTVIP, we show how multiple models are integrated to form larger system. This really supports parallel development by multiple organizations. So the ACTVIP model serves multiple purposes. We use it for analysis, we can use it for documentation, we can even use it for communication. For example, we show that uh, we can use the ECVIP uh, modeling uh, template and analysis harness, both for integration, but also for communicating requirements to subcontractors and doing testing on, on subcontracted components. So ECVIP really employs models both for integration and analysis. Now, when we're talking about modeling, we need to talk about level of detail or level of fidelity. And we just kind of have a, uh, a list here of the different kinds of elements you'll see in a model at different fidelity levels. So at kind of a low level of detail, we model the system, maybe the inputs and outputs and flows through the system, data flows through the system. A little bit more detail, we'll add subcomponents and connections and things. Another step down, we can add software threads, end-to-end -end flows, maybe talk about some error propagations. Then later in, in more level of detail, we can start adding hardware. We can talk about processors, memory, bus hardware. We can start binding uh, software to certain processors and things. And at the most detailed levels, we can start talking about behaviors, sub-program calls. You can even start talking about code generation. So, one key point about ACVIP is that we can have different portions of our model at different levels of fidelity. The other key message here is that as we progress through a development project, we will be increasing the level of detail in our models. So let me talk a little bit about iterative model refinement. That was something uh, that one of the commenters said. And what I want to show here is that very early in the design process, we still need to start talking about ACFIP. So I'm showing a model of a mission system, or I often just refer to it as the system under development. And the only thing I really know at this point is that I have a mission system and I've got some inputs probably coming from sensors, some inputs coming from radar, radios, and I'm gonna have outputs going off to a flight deck. Even at this level of detail, I can start thinking about some of the ACVIP analysis. I can talk about my security, my MILS analysis. Are these sensors at a different level of security than the radio data? If so, I can actually label these data flows with security levels, and I can pass this requirement onto the mission system that it's going to have to be able to handle multiple security levels. I can also talk about safety and risk assessment. What happens if this sensor signal goes away? Well, I can add properties on that, um, on that data, on that uh, connection and say that you need to handle these kinds of errors. What happens if that signal is late? Does that have ramifications for the flight deck? And these can really turn into, once again, requirements. The mission system must be able to handle those kinds of errors. Um, we can also start talking about latency, even at this very, very uh, high level of, of, or low level of detail. For example, um, sometimes we get a requirement that says, uh, we've got 100 milliseconds between the time of a sensor detect and you displaying that information on the flight deck. 
we can define a flow that starts with a sensor, goes through mission system, ends up at the flight deck, and we can put a latency budget of 100 milliseconds on that flow. So the key message here is that even in this early level of ref refinement, ACVIP analysis should be considered. Now, as we add more detail to our system, now maybe we know what some of the components inside the mission system are gonna look like. We know there are two components and a couple of interfaces and things. We can start doing a little bit more analysis. We can talk about interconnection consistency. We can make sure that the output of component one matches what's expected by the input of component two. We can talk about propagation of errors now. If, uh, if the sensor is late, how does that affect the processing within the interface, within the component? And how does that uh, result in something at the flight deck? Or is it handled by some of these components? And we can take our latency budget, which uh, we had for the entire mission system, kind of our 100 milliseconds, and we can uh, provide budgets to the individual components. We can maybe say, well, let's just, for, for starters, let's split that in half and say, you know, we can use half of our latency here and half of our latency here. We can start spreading out our budgets. So additional model fidelity really gives us additional detail in our analysis. Now, as we move even more detail, now we maybe start adding some hardware components. We add CPU, bus, memory. We can now start talking about higher level fidelity analysis. We can uh, look at utilization of our CPU and memory in our bus. And we can get our full latency numbers now. Now we can uh, put some real numbers on some of these soft software threads and we can calculate the latency on this flow that we were concerned about. And we can compare that to the budget that was assigned to the mission system. I think uh, John earlier talked about the, the available tooling for the ACVIP, ACVIP analysis tools, but there's quite a toolbox of analysis tools that we can bring to bear. And I do want to point out that many of these tools are built into Osate. Some of these tools are available on, on uh, Adventium Labs CAMA site. And for more information there, once again, go to Adventium Labs homepage and there's a button for information on CAMA. Now talking about virtual integration, kind of a key portion of ACVIP. Uh, and that's the idea that we can combine model components into a larger system to support analysis and testing. Virtual integration in ACVIP lets us find interface inconsistencies. It supports mixed fidelity models. So one component can be at one level of detail and another component can be at a different level of detail. It supports hierarchically organized models, this idea of, re of refinement. We perform ACVIP early in the design process. It should be repeated, ideally, whenever a model changes. You make a change to the model, you wanna run your analysis suite to see if you're still within budgets, to see if you still can uh, verify the requirements. And uh, to support that, majority of these tools can be automated. And so we can do automated analysis. So to show you how this integration happens, we have this concept of the template of the system, and that may include some subcomponents. And then we provide an analysis harness. And the analysis harness is literally everything outside the system that we need to use for analysis. If, if this uh, system under test is a mission system, this analysis harness might include the rest of the aircraft. It might include uh, the crew it might include uh, something to trigger sensors, but we use this analysis harness to perform this analysis. Now these individual components can in turn become templates for some of our suppliers. So let's say we have a number of different components in our system and we're gonna have different uh, suppliers develop those components. We give them a template, which is sort of like a a mission system or a, a system template on its own, but it's a, it's a black box template. It just has the inputs and outputs and some of the performance requirements or, or parameters. We can also give them an analysis harness that gives them the support, and maybe that includes a power supply or a data source, so that they can test their template in their own environment. 
then how this proceeds is that they flesh out this model, add detail to that component, they return that component, and now we can fit that into the larger system and run our system-wide analysis. So that is our virtual integration of just pulling that model back in and doing that full system analysis. So kind of to summarize these solutions, we use a single common model for multiple uses. We use common user interface definitions. We've got this iterative model refinement. We've got virtual integration, analysis tools for requirements verification, and we can do much of this autonomously. So now, Adam, I think we can uh, look at some of the issues that were presented in the chat and some of these that fell out of the, the video. So I wanna show you now that when we work through the class, we're gonna be using a, uh, an Excel workbook and we've got kind of different tabs in the workbook for different steps in the, in the ActVib workflow. And this is one of the early tabs where we start uh, uh, listing out some of the, some of the issues that uh, can befall program management. And across this, uh, this row, we have the solutions that I, just, that I just mentioned. So we've got virtual integration, autonomous, common interface definitions. Now here are some of the uh, issues that uh, came up in, in the chat window. Some of them came out of our, uh, our, um, our video. And what we'll do in the class is we'll kind of fill out this matrix. We'll look at how some of these issues uh, can be um, met by some of these uh, solutions in ActVib. So for example, uh, poor coordination among development teams. Well, things like just having a single model across the development teams can be very useful. Having common interface definitions can help there. Uh, design issues are found very late during system integration. Well, we'll do iterative model refinement and we'll do this virtual integration autonomously. That can really help with that kind of issue. Safety and security certification requires system changes late. Well, if we do continuous, or if we do our verification, we run our verification tools and we do this continuously and autonomously, that can really help with some of those kinds of issues. Uh, because of time, I, you know, we're not gonna fill this out now, but we'll, we'll talk about that more in the class and just show how that a lot of these issues are addressed by, by AgFib solutions. Now I wanna jump back to Talk a little bit about the overall workflow. So a big part of the goal of ActVIP is to start with project goals and really come up with this ActVIP management plan to address those goals. So we've got goals and requirements. And so for example, maybe one of our goals is to, we don't want to overload our hardware. Well, that could lead to a technical requirement, a little bit more specifics keep our CPU utilization under 50%. And then we'll look at what are some analysis methods we can use to verify that requirement? Well, we actually have a method called CPU resource utilization. And then the next question is, what are some of the analysis tools at our disposal? Well, there's a CAMA tool called Analyze Utilization for the CPU. Now, if we select that particular tool, that leads to some very specific properties that need to be in the model. For example, we need to have a property in our model or in our analysis harness that reflects this requirement. It would be an allowed processor utilization requirement. That's literally the name of the property. We also have properties that need to show up in the component model. The component needs to have MIPS budgets for the different software components. So as you can see, as we work through the workflow, we add more and more detail to our model. And at this level, because we wanna run this analysis, this really tells us there are certain components, there's certain level of fidelity. The model must have these kinds of elements. We must have processors in there. We must have software threads and bindings between them. So when we get to developing our ActVIP management plan 
and deciding what kinds of analysis we can do at the different reviews, this level of fidelity tells us that, well, this needs to be kind of one of our later reviews because there's quite a bit of detail in the model. I want to jump back to our spreadsheet and show you how we can work through this using our uh, workbook. So we can list out our technical requirements on, on this page. And uh, our example here, we CPU loading has to be less than 50%. Our next step is to select a particular analysis method. And we think maybe CPU resource utilization might be a good method there. So we'll jump ahead at the tab. And now we need to select an analysis tool. And let's select the CAMA Analyze Utilization. Moving one more tab. Now this tells us the specific properties that need to be included in our model. And we need to have a MIPS capacity. And these are properties that will go into the analysis harness as kind of resource um, or as, as requirements or budgets. We can also go to the next tab and see that this is going to tell us we need this uh, fidelity level four where you have to have processor bindings. And another tab will show us that within the template itself, we are going to have to have MIPS budgets in properties. As we roll up these properties, um, kind of the final tab and something we'll be talking about when we talk about developing the active management plan is that we need to schedule reviews and we need to schedule different analysis results that we can show at these different reviews. So for example, the early high level review, maybe we would say, you know, at this review, we think we can show Mills analysis. And uh, the spreadsheet really, really shows us that, well, you're gonna have to have subcomponents, some connections, maybe some processes. At the mid-level review, Maybe we would show, let's talk about flow latency in the mid-level review. And that means we're going to have to have end-to-end -end flows. And maybe in a later review, we can get a little bit more detail and talk about uh, some of our resource allocation kinds of things. Let's look at utilization of the CPU. Well, at this point, we're going to have to have hardware components and bindings and things modeled. So this gives us a tool for kind of planning out our reviews and, and what level of model detail we'll include in the different reviews. Hey, Rand, I'm just going to let you know we've got five minutes yes. left, and I've, okay. I've told the attendees uh, uh, now's the time to put uh, Q&A in. So uh, yeah. that yes. five minutes will include any Q&A that is generated. Okay, okay. And actually, this is this is the last slide. I just wanted to tell people that this is kind of an outline of the training class. Uh, ACVIP overview, you saw a lot of that today. Uh, the second class, we'll talk about developing the ACVIP management plan, uh, taking some of these reviews, putting them on a timeline. And then we'll look at structuring the models for delivery. We'll do some look at analysis tools in a couple of modules. We'll do some development of, uh, of models in a, in a multi-organizational or distributed kind of environment. We'll integrate those models back together. And finally, we'll talk about certification and some of these other tools. So at this point, uh, I, I think we're ready for some questions. We have none so far. Someone ah. did mention there was a disregard for pilot safety. <laughs> there, was the, uh... <laughs> there was definitely a disregard for pilot safety in the video. And uh, that is something uh. that uh, we would definitely include in our risk analysis right. and see how we can turn that into uh, specific system requirements, things right. having to do with latencies or, uh, or oh, well, overloading of CPU prioritization of different tasks and things. So I've got a question for you. Is there a technique to manage airworthiness requirements outside the system MBSC process, a parallel analysis or tracking tool? You know, I'm actually not a good person to answer that question, at least as far as tools outside of 
um, the AADL environment and, and ACVIP. I'm, I'm sure there are a number of different tools, but I will say that kind of the, the goal of ACVIP is to not have to have different models for different analysis. I will say that some of the risk analysis kinds of things you can do with either the EM, EMV2 or some of the STPA analysis uh, can certainly feed into those other processes. Uh, you can identify lots of hazards and, and things that uh, can feed into those other processes. Also, something I didn't mention is one of the features of the ACVIP tools is that we have very customizable reports. And so you can customize the reports for some of those tools to become the, the supporting evidence and documentation for those processes. But there's still a lot of work to be done in, in bringing, especially some of those certifications into, into the ACVIP workflow. While we're waiting, I'll just uh, point out that if, if you're interested in taking this training class, we have a version for the government and also one for industry, and you can find out more on the Adventium webpage. Yep, the government uh, folks need to contact Alex Boydston directly. Talk to Alex. Yep. yep. Are there any other, any other questions we can answer? One more, I think we'll finish this up. How do you get the early estimates for high level, low fidelity models? Yeah, so that, that is one of the big questions is how do we do this estimating? Now remember there's sort of two parts to the process. One is the budgeting process and those budgets come from your requirements. So you're kind of working from the top down of and saying that uh, you know I have a hundred milliseconds and that is a firm requirement. And so early in the modeling, I just talk about, well, how can I apportion that? And you can even you know take wild guesses of saying, I'm gonna have half of it on this component, half of it on this component. What the analysis does very nicely is it continuously checks that budgeting against your top level requirement but also what's really nice about the iterative refinement process is as you add more detail to your model, those fuzzier estimates you made at the top are automatically replaced by more detailed estimates in the model. So yeah, there, there is a certain level at the beginning where, where you, you make estimates on both budgets and, and what some of the uh, usage will be. But as you go further in the process, you, you definitely add detail and add uh, accuracy to those values. Thanks, Rand. We'll try to answer other questions in the chat. I think Jerome's here to Absolutely. send us on our way. Yeah, so thanks, Rand and uh, Adam, for uh, for this quick overview of AgVips. It was really interesting. And I really hope that a lot of people will follow up with you guys and continue learning more about this. So this is my, now my role just to conclude this third edition of the ADL and IVP user days. So it was really two very interesting sessions. And during those two sessions, speakers introduced many of the latest developments around ADL and IVP. So as you may have seen, both technologies are reaching new maturity milestones to, and are delivering new tools to enrich the panel of model-based systems engineering practice. They cover not just modeling the system, drawing it, basically, but truly they go further and provide the toolbox to engineer a system in all its dimensions, connection with requirements, architecting a system, making sure that it is conformed to specific modeling guidelines, and ensure that the system can be verified and then is verified for such quality attributes like safety, resiliency, or cybersecurity. All the speakers also demonstrated to some extent the capabilities that ADL has to bridge uh, across multiple domains in all directions uh, on the V-cycles, like for instance, from systems engineering to architecting your system, from the architectural description to more detailed design in connection with a large uh, set of analysis toolboxes. As we are closing those days, let me remind you that all materials will be made available in a couple of weeks. Our outreach team will let you know when they are available. If you have any question about the event, please reach out to info, .info at sci.cmu.edu. 
Thanks again to all the speakers and the audience, and we hope to see you all again in another event organized by the SEI. Thank you.